It's Monday, the 19th of February. My name's Juan Brown. You're watching the Blanco Lirio channel. And this morning's update begins in Serbia, where a Marathon Airlines ERJ-195 jet tried to do a midfield intersection departure at Belgrade's airport. Tried to make it, but didn't quite causing extensive damage to the ERJ-195 as he hit obstacles well off of the departure end of the runway. He flew around for quite some time burning off fuel before returning and taxiing this wreck back to the gate and deplaning the passengers safely. The white foam is the foam from the firefighters and I believe that is fuel leaking out of the left wing route. Let's check it out. First, let's start with Simon Radecki's Aviation Herald. A marathon Embraer ERJ-195 on behalf of Air Serbia, performing flight as uh, flight number 324 from Belgrade to Dusseldorf with 106 people on board, had lined up runway 30 left at taxiway Delta 5, which only leaves them about 4,175 feet of runway and departed at 1638Z, but overran the end of the runway before becoming airborne. Not enough runway length. Following a collision with the high precision approach lights of runway 12 right past the end of the runway, the aircraft became airborne about 500 meters or 1,650 feet past the runway end. Climbed through 50 feet AGL, about 6,700 feet past the end of the runway, stopped the climb at 4,000 feet, burned off fuel, and returned to Belgrade for a landing on runway 30 left without further incident about 55 minutes after departure. No injuries. Substantial damage. Following the occurrence, the ILS for runway 12 right was downgraded from Cat 3 to Cat 1 as he plowed through the localizer antennas. Passengers reported immediately after takeoff, something broke, the aircraft shook, then they entered a holding pattern for about an hour before returning to land at Belgrade. They were quickly escorted off the aircraft and they weren't told anything except it was a minor incident. However, they could see something had broken off of the left wing. Here's a closer shot of some of the damage. That's a lot of the white foam you see on the fuselage, but that cut quite a bit into the wing root fairing area of the aircraft possibly all the way back to the main spar attach fitting and more damage to this fairing area located below the wing as well and the angle of these of this damage indicates that he was rotate rotating like heck to try to get the aircraft up and off of the ground as he was ripping through those antennas and looks like also damage to the left horizontal stabilizer as well which would make sense because the tail is very low to the ground when you're in the uh, rotate position, lifting the nose to fly the aircraft off of the ground. Uh, here's the runway diagram. It's a little bit long here, but here's taxiway Delta five right here, which is about midfield and simply did not give him enough runway distance to take off in. And the antennas that he struck are located out over here. Now, as we look at this uh, dated photograph from Google Earth, you can see the construction going on with the new runway. But out here are the precision approach lights guiding the aircraft into the runway 12 and Right out here, you've got localizer antennas, more lights and more antennas all the way out to here before you get to the road. If you take a look from the road, you can see the construction and it's relatively level terrain. Well, looking back towards the runway there. There's additional light poles and low obstacles off the end of the runway here. As we look at the data from ADSB Exchange, it looks like it's got data from two different flights that day. One departed around 12Z from intersection Delta 6, another intersection departure 
and proceeded all the way out to its destination and came back. And then the accident flight occurred here around 1637. Here they decided to take the Delta V taxiway about midway down the runway. Accelerating on the ground. They're still showing on the ground here, 135 knots on the ground, 142 knots, still basically on the ground, well off of the end of the runway. Still not getting a positive rate of climb. Oh, 128 feet per minute right here. And 475 feet per minute right here. Just dragging it right off of the end of the runway. 153 knots. 192 foot per minute vertical climb, but hardly any altitude at all. Just missing the road and the obstacles off the end here, but took out the lights and the antennas off the end of the runway. Looks like they pretty immediately turned around and began to set up a holding pattern or multiple holding patterns. Now, the whole thing about burning off fuel, the ERJ does not have the fuel dumping capability. There really is, in my opinion, no need to burn fuel or dump fuel. If you do the landing calcs and you've got enough runway distance to make your landing distance good, there's no need to burn off the uh, fuel before landing you're already an emergency aircraft just because you're doing an overweight landing yeah you need to declare an emergency to do an overweight landing but there's no harm no foul to the airplane if you do an overweight landing smoothly enough you just need to record it in the logbook so that proper inspections can be made but this aircraft's going to be getting a whole bunch of inspections already some of you ERJ guys out there could do the actual takeoff distance calculation for this particular situation, but it looks like according to the sales brochure, you're going to need at least 6,500 feet at max gross weight for the LR model. So why did the captain decide to go for Delta V and intersection takeoff, leaving more than half of the runway behind him? Was it another case of a big hurry? Was it another case of a Tenerife style CRM? What was the first officer saying uh, regarding that decision? Was he just simply complying with it and going along? The three things in aviation, the runway behind you, the altitude above you, and the fuel left in the fuel tank, all very basic. Next, we go to Boise, Idaho, where a Eclipse Jet 500 apparently landed with his tow bar still attached to his nose gear. On February 14, 2024, about 1838 local time, an Eclipse 500 registered to PEI Holdings out of Boise sustained minor damage when it was involved in an accident at Boise Airport. No injuries. The flight had originated from Caldwell, which is very close to Boise, at about 1831. The FAA reported that the airplane landed with a tow bar still attached to the front gear. Uh, how does that happen? Well, it, it does happen. It can happen. And it usually happens because you're pre-flighting your aircraft and you get distracted by something like this or some other form of distraction. Let's take a look at that nose tow bar. Here's the basic stock steel tow bar for an Eclipse jet. You can have any variety of other powered toes like a best tug or a remote tow but this is the basic hand pulled 30 pound steel tow bar and of course it would normally have a handle attached to the end of it with which to tow the aircraft around with the eclipse jet's a small jet about 12,500 pound gross weight jet it's a really neat go fast high altitude jet for folks with a lot of money the atc audio was captured here on the flight records YouTube channel and you can see the very short flight from Caldwell over to Boise. I wondered if the pilot even bothered to retract the gear on such a short flight and how does the tow bar stay on once you go to retract the gear? Or are you just really damaging that gear when you do that? Or how would you even get a gear up light if the tow bar is still attached? 
So the pilot told the tower that they, he's got a loud noise coming from the nose gear area and he needs to stop the aircraft or clear the runway. And then he decided he needed to get a tow off the runway. Then there was this exchange from the ground guys as captured by live ATC on the flight records channel. So good job closing the runway and checking for FOD from that tow bar. Taking off with the tow bar in place is not that uncommon. I have not yet done that myself, but the tow bar just attaches to the nose gear and it's a relatively small bar and you cannot see the tow bar from the cockpit of the aircraft once you get in the airplane. So things I do to help mitigate me not forgetting to take my tow bar off the 310, which would probably kill the 310 because if you retracted the gear with the tow bar in place and if it didn't just snap right off, it would get all bungled up with the nose gear retraction. The nose gear probably would not extend. If the nose gear does not extend on the Cessna 310, you're going to end up taking out both engines and that's going to be the end of the 310 because of the propeller strikes. So in order to not make this mistake i do two things one thing a new policy i've got here around here nowadays is i go into airplane mode when i pull into the airport when i'm ready to go flying i want to put myself in airplane mode and just think constantly of just the mission ahead the flight ahead and that includes turning the airplane into onto airplane mode i see so many times we get distracted with a phone call a text or a message on the phone in the middle of a pre-flight inspection potentially hugely distracting the other thing i do is i'll do a detailed uh, my detailed pre-flight something all the tanks and then after i've got folks loaded onto the airplane and before i step into the airplane i'll walk around the aircraft one more time in the opposite direction and check for fuel filler caps did i get them put on this time tow bar is it back in the baggage compartment where it belongs and any doors baggage doors are closed and secured just looking for the big things on a second cursory walk around finally we got a very busy weather day here at blanco lirio global headquarters we received two and a quarter inches of rain just last night in about a four to five hour window very heavy downpour of rain that rain has since moved off to the west but now and that was a warm rain and now we've got this low pressure moving into the area that's bringing colder air on top of this warmer air and is going to set up a lot of convective activity even with the possibility of some small tornadic activity in the sacramento valley area which is pretty rare but does <laughs> it's pretty rare but it happens every spring for the best information on all this weather information and just a general overview of what it's like to be a professional meteorologist again check out mark finan's youtube weather channel mark finan is the main meteorologist for kcra3 tv here in sacramento california but he's started this youtube channel and he goes into details behind the scenes look of how he gets all of his information and he's taught us a lot about using the data that's available out there including these skew t charts which i began to get a little bit familiar with when i uh, checked into learning how to fly sailplanes and i really need and want to go get a sailplane rating and learn more all about this fascinating meteorology Mark showed us where to get all this great data from the College of DuPage. Here's the uh, radar reflectivity on the short range chart showing the low pressure off of here and the potential thunderstorms blossoming throughout the afternoon today here in the uh, Northern California area. Then Mark showed us this really neat website here where you can track weather balloons in real time. Weather balloons are released twice a day at a at a certain time of day from certain locations so they don't need NOTAMs to NOTAM the uh, airliners that they're going up and if there's um, unusual weather events and they need more data they'll launch balloons outside of the regular window and then they will get a NOTAM to warn the aircraft that they're launching additional weather balloons 
but it's so neat to see this balloon right here tracking uh, just over just north of yuba city and you can click on the skew t chart let me move me out of the way here the skew t chart for this particular weather balloon is shown right here and if we can look at that standard lapse rate line the smooth purple line there which won't stay on for me and the red line which is the temperature and the blue line which is the dew point that red temperature that parcel of air is cooling faster than standard so that air is going to rise quicker so that's a good indication as to the amount of convective activity you're going to get for the day so everything that's in that area to the right of the red line up to the smooth purple line there that i'm learning they call that cape convective um, potential energy so anything in that area means that we got a, a day that may be very conducive towards thunderstorms and for a glider pilot that means a good day for soaring and there's so much more information that can be gleaned from these skew t charts especially for glider pilots that i am just fascinated with and it's <laughs> taking a couple of days of research or more to really learn, get into these charts and figure out how they work. They're called skew T because they skew the temperature 45 degrees so that it makes the chart easier to read. See that skew? And they're also called a um, log P, logarithmic P. This is the pressure on the uh, vertical axis here, which is shown in a logarithmic scale so you've got sea level down here at the bottom and 500 millibars about 18,000 feet right here that's about half of the atmosphere and there's the very top of the atmosphere and then you can see the inversion layer where the temperatures take off to the right and they begin to warm the skew t log p chart and another thing they'll be looking at on these skew t charts are, is the wind direction change uh, in altitude so the more twist you've got to the winds as you go up in altitude the more likely you could set up tornadic activity fascinating stuff for a much better explanation check out mark finan's youtube channel mark finan weather thanks so much for your support of this channel especially the folks over on patreon that make this content possible see you here